Hello everyone, I'm going to take you through my process of how I make pattern welded steel, often called Damascus. Uh, Damascus is a slight uh, point of contention among people that are purists. Um, Wootz steel, that's W-O-O-T-Z, Wootz, Wootz steel or crucible steel is a common type of steel that's referred to as Damascus, but what I'm making is pattern welded steel. And that's alternating layers of nickel 15N20 and 1095 high carbon. So I got two different layers here. They're cut and stacked. They're a little dirty though. I'm gonna have to go through and lean them up. When you're making this type of Damascus or pattern welded steel, you cannot have any scale. All the scale has to be removed. Any dirt has to be removed. And you'll see here I'm grinding off just with a little uh, uh, flap disc very lightly, cleaning off any mill scale, any corrosion, any type of uh, oxide layer, anything on that surface. I'm going to lightly grind each plate. Um, and then I'm going to go through and clean them thoroughly as well. So you see me grinding this. This happens to be a nickel. Uh, this is a piece of 15N20. It has uh, some nickel in it. That's going to resist uh, the etching compound when we later uh, put in some ferrochloride or some type of etching agent. That's going to resist the etch and it's going to stay shiny. It's going to contribute to the contrast you're going to see in the pattern when we're done. So there it is. All shiny. Now I'll go through and clean these, each one, with acetone. So it's pretty simple. <laughs> you, you wipe it down with acetone front and back and that cleans. And sometimes there's a surprising amount of dirt on these and dirt is the enemy. Every type of oxide is the enemy. Any oxide layer, oxygen getting into the in-between during forging, yeah, that's the enemy. Uh, as soon as uh, oxides form, uh, the fusion of the metals becomes very difficult, if not impossible. So there's three main components you need to fuse metal together. It's quite simply this. You need heat, you need pressure, and you need cleanliness. So those, those are the three elements. Now, you can have those in varying degrees. You could have the metal unbelievably clean and you would need less pressure and less, temp less temperature. If you had really high temps, you would need less pressure and less cleanliness. Super high pressure, you could get away with lower temps. And you get the idea. But in this video, I'm going to be making a combination of these three things. I'm going to get it as clean as I can in my garage here. I'm going to use as much temperature as I can safely attain. And then I'm going to use as much pressure as my forge press will allow. So here I am. Now, these have all been ground nice and shiny. I've cleaned them with acetone. Now I'm going to weld these together. So you'll see me, I run a bead down the corners and I run a bead down the middle. This type of, uh, uh, this type of uh, pattern welded billet, if, if you will, it wants to spread apart in the middle. Uh, as soon as you start pressing on it, it wants to spread. Matter of fact, when you're heating it, it wants to spread. So one of uh, the tricks you can do that, that help in forging this is you run a bead down the middle and you can see I'm running a little I'm using my MIG welder I run a bead down the middle on both sides and I run a bead down uh, the corner of each corner as well and so that's going to hold this stack of alternating layers of 15N20 and 1095 it's going to hold it together keep it from shifting once it's once it's initially forged and it's all fused and it's homogenous there's a $20 word homogenous then these welds are pretty much unnecessary. Now I'm going to go through another process I did here too. Once this is all welded up, I actually encase the entire thing in sheet metal. Now you can use a flux on this as you're getting ready to forge, but I find that this process guarantees the results. If you encase this in encapsulated in sheet metal, and it's atmosphere free 
it, there's there's uh, you know you can't get a cold shut as it's known where you know there's a layer that doesn't fully uh, com uh, fuse. So here's I'm using some very light gauge sheet metal. This is like 20 gauge or 26 gauge. It's so very thin, and the sheet sheet metal actually will will actually just fall off as you're forging. But you can see I've wrapped my billet entirely in sheet metal, encased it entirely, and I welded the back shut and I welded a rebar handle on it. So this this is completely sealed, and I have placed inside a combustible material. I put a piece of paper inside. And you'll hear here, I'll tap on it. You can kind of hear a hollow sound. Now that paper will burn, and that paper will consume all the oxygen that's inside there. And I have one on each side in between the stack and the sheet metal wrap. Now, here it is in my uh, little furnace. Now the forging temp is quite a debate. Uh, I mean, it's not really a debate. Some people say 2200, 2300, 2400. There's a decarburization that occurs in certain steels when you heat them above a certain point. So there's a danger in decarbing the steel. So you see here I'm running at 2250, right around there, 2250. And that's actually, my parameter is at a cold spot. So it's actually closer to 2300. But I forge at 2300 all day long, 2300 degrees, that's Fahrenheit. Now here you're going to see my initial forge. This is my first press, and you can see I'm not getting too aggressive. This is just to initially set, so I'm not, I'm not going crazy. This press will crush this whole billet, no problem. I'm just giving it a little squeeze, and you can see here it actually kind of fused to my, my dies are a little cold, so I have to give it a little hit here to loosen it. But now, now it's initially set. I will very lightly light I guess is a this forge press is rated for 40 tons but I will go through and, and and not as aggressively begin to compress this billet this is my initial set which I I've done uh, lengthwise on my on my flattening dies and so this is just the initial set now I'm gonna put this back in I'm gonna get it much hotter and I'm really going to get aggressive with forging that. Now I actually have three separate pieces of steel in my furnace. Now this is very efficient. You can work one while the other two are heating up. And so it's a very efficient use. Instead of having your furnace just run with nothing in there, always have two or three uh, uh, billets you can work on and forge. And then one, now one can be worked on while the other one is heated. And you can be in a constant state of rotation. It's a very efficient use of steel. Now here I'm just spraying down this handle. These handles get hot. Um, I need to have a better system for this, but <clears throat> this is just kind of how I do it. I take some, uh, I take a spray bottle. I spray down the uh, the handle. Just get it cool enough. Now you actually see me. I switch out my gloves. I have gloves that are rated for much higher temps. Uh, the handles get kind of warm, and so you'll see in this next shot here. I actually. Uh, I swap out those gloves for a different set of gloves. But now you can see I have another billet in there that's at a different stage. It's already been compressed, and I'm just going to be drawing that out. You'll see I'll take this one out. This one has already been compressed. Now I'm going to draw this one out. Now you can see that halo around that. You can see kind of the effervescence or whatever you'd like to call it. That billet is at perfect forging temp. And a pyrometer helps get you close, but there's some visual... Many guys just forge by visual inspection alone. They view the piece and they look at it and they see the, the they judge by temperature. And a lot of people have the confidence to do this. I've done it sometimes. I usually rely on my pyrometer in my uh, I have a pretty accurate digital py pyrometer in my in my uh, furnace. So you see, I just switched out my gloves. <clears throat> this is much more comfortable now. I might do a video on this. I built this forge press myself. I constructed the entire thing, I designed it, uh, built it, everything, electronics, uh, the hydraulics, all the metal work, all the bearings, all the stuff, I designed this myself. It's a very effective press. It can move a lot of metal. I rarely run it above like 2200 PSI in the hydraulic system, and that's I think that's good enough for 30 tons, I think, or 35 tons. But if I ran it up like 2950, 
uh, PSI, I think that's be 82,000 pounds, but I really need that. And then I never even hit my relief valve. When I'm making these billets here, uh, maybe I'll try and include some shots of my uh, the PSI gauge on the side. You can't see it in the shots on the, on the other side of the press, but I, I'm never hitting it, uh, the relief valve. It uh, stays well under that. Uh, this is you know, 20 tons, 25 tons. This is a lot of force for pressing, and a hydraulic press is it's not just the impact. It's squeezing that steel. You can move a lot of steel with one of these presses. And so here I am. I'm just drawing this billet out. I'm drawing this billet out. And you'll see I'll go back, I'll grab one of my other ones. Now this is the piece that you that you saw wrapped in sheet metal. Most of that sheet metal, the, sl the scale, as it scales up, just uh, drops off. And you don't even really have to grind it off. It naturally kind of falls off. You see the scale kind of, uh, you know, fall off as it, and this sheet metal is thin enough. But now I have this a little hotter than I did initially. Um, so uh, I'm running this at a little more hotter temp now, and I am really I'm getting more aggressive with my with some of my pressing operations here. Now I think I have 22 layers in the stack. I think 22 or 25 layers, and you can actually kind of see the sl the scale that falls off the sides. You can see the layers. Um, kind of see evidence of all the layers that's in there. Now you can after this is drawn out, you can cut it and restack it and I'd be at a, almost 100 layers, and then you could cut it and restack it, and it'd be at two or 300 layers. And you can actually keep on going. Um, you're, you're really only limited by your imagination on how many layers of this uh, pattern welded or Damascus steel you want to get. And so uh, there is a material loss when you cut and restack. So you traditionally have to start with a larger chunk of steel than what you want to finish up with. And you can twist these, and you can do a multi-bar. Uh, you can sandwich uh, different types of Damascus around a core. You can, I mean, there's just an infinite amount of ideas on this, guys. You can go, and I, what I'm showing you here is a very basic type of Damascus pattern. Very basic. I do uh, show some little uh, uh, variations here in these three uh, billets. I have one where I turn and press and you'll see later on I'm pressing that at, on the corners and that creates an M or a W profile within the within the Damascus billet itself and then when you draw that out and you can restack it there's, there's so many subtleties I, I couldn't begin to cover all the subtleties of, subtleties of pattern welding in one video not even close but this video is just going to show how I do it and so here I am kind of straightening and flattening this billet back up. Now look at it. In, in just a couple of heats, look at how much longer this has gotten versus that original big chunk that's there. So and you'll see here I built this I built this little propane furnace myself as well. I constructed this and made it. It's lined with uh, two inches of ceramic uh, a blanket. And then it's got a coat, coating of satinite. And then... Uh, on top of the satinite, I have some uh, volcano infrared reflector coating, and I easily I could probably get the 2400 on this. I usually keep it around 22, somewhere between 2200 and 2300. It's perfect for forging, um, for for making Damascus. Now this is a bar that I've already drawn out, that I'm flattening out. Now this bar I think has a lower layer count. Yeah. Now I double stack, so I want you know, two uh, nickel, two uh, 1095, two nickel, 295. So this bar will have a pretty bold pattern. Now you can use thinner uh, plates and stack them and, and, and create a higher layer initial count, or you can cut and restack and draw it out and just keep repeating it till you get whatever layer count you want. But, um, uh, and this I'm drawing out. This bill you see here is going to be a future project. I'm, I'm making a Damascus butterfly knife for my daughter. And so uh, this billet, you see here, I'm actually drawing out to a knife blank size. It's going to be a very bold pattern for, uh, that's a low layer count. You know, a high layer count has lots of lines and striations. This one is going to have a very bold pattern. And this is going to be for a butter, uh, an upcoming project. You'll probably see my next video I'll be making. Uh, a butterfly knife so 
I'm just drawing this one out. And now you see here, I got a couple of dies here. I have a set of square dies. These are called combo dies. At least I call them combo. And I can, these dies have just a, a one screw that hold them on. They slide in and out. I can change these dies very quickly. And I have squaring dies and I have rounding dies to produce different types of shapes. Um, so you can change those dies out. But uh, uh, the round dies really concentrate the pressure and elongate the steel. And the flattening dies are a little more even pressured, but and and I really want to thank my wife for doing all these shots. It's a bit of a uh, juggling act to uh, follow someone around while they're carrying glowing chunks of steel and not get stabbed or burnt. But so and here's you can see the temps now. I'm getting I have my temps set a little higher. Now that I know that the uh, the bar is forged and and it's it's homogeneous, I'm getting a little more aggressive in the pressure and uh, of this uh, to draw these out. And so, I actually at this point could start lowering my temperatures, but I still I'm still looking to have uh, probably my first three or four heats on drawing a bar out. I really want that I want that temperature up there around that 2200 or 2300 is what I want now you can see I'm kind of turning this sideways and kind of instead of continuing squaring it I'm I'm now hitting it on the corners and this produces a different pattern in the steel but um, but anyway here you can see I'm, I'm just going now these these bars start getting pretty long and what I have to do at this point and I don't show it in the video is I have to cut the handle off and then I have to use a pair of blacksmith tongs to turn the piece around so I can work the other end because once this gets about 20 inches long it won't fit end to end in my, my furnace anymore it just sticks out too far so I have to work on one end then stick the other end in pull it out I almost designed my furnace a certain way to uh, with a hole on both ends um, but with the burners that I chose and and sizing the, the burners uh, I decided to enclose the back and, and not put a through hole through my furnace now if you're sizing your burners you'll do a rating for your burner these are the propane burner on your furnace they're rated for so many square inches so like one burner will heat you know 50 cubic inches or something like that so when you're building your furnace you have to know that if you're going to run one burner you're limited to this internal size on your furnace if you're running two burners you can have this size um, and so there's a balance to building those uh, and how you construct it but you now I'm drawing this bar out pretty good this bar is just about down to the the, the square size I'm looking for for a, and I'll this bar will probably be cut and restacked but you can see how it's longer now and starting to stick out and so uh, yeah, you can see the flame. There's a generous amount of flame coming out of the front of my furnace. Now that's called a reducing flame. Uh, you want, you don't want a bunch of spare oxygen inside that. So instead of, it's it's a less efficient of a burn. You could pump. I could adjust those burners, and I could put a lot more air into that into that furnace. A lot more air. But what that would do is it would increase the chances of oxidation and and, and scaling and, and all those things uh, that would occur that are the enemy of this uh, forge welding is the enemy of of getting a clean fusion of these metals so you want to set uh, your burners so that there's a generous amount of flame now you lose some efficiency and you can you can get higher temps if you're pumping a lot of air in there but you want to balance so the best way to the best way to configure a proper flame for, for forging pattern welding or, or Damascus as it's known is you want to have a good amount of flame coming out the face uh, the opening of the furnace now what that means is there's some unburnt propane and so but that's gonna that's gonna allow all the propane that's that is inside there to consume all the oxygen so there won't be a bunch of uh, 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 you know oxygen looking around to scale up and, and mess with your welds, and that's what I'm doing. If I'm just forging out some steel <clears throat> to make something, 
I run a much lower temperature. You know, you can easily forge at, you know, uh, you know, 1500, 1600, 1700. You can actually manipulate metal pretty easily, especially if you have a forge, a hydraulic forge press like this or, or a power hammer. But um, you can actually manipulate steel pretty easily. You don't have to go all the way up to 2300 degrees. This temperature you see is really specifically geared towards pattern welding the Dama this this Damascus or pattern welding so it's quite a little bit of intricate dance to swing around but you get used to it and it actually it actually becomes quite enjoyable um, I mean it's very hot you'll be sweating a lot and but it's mesmerizing when you're staring at that steel and it's glowing and you're just manipulating it and and you can't see it but you know there's you know all these layers in there there's something just fascinating about it and it's I'll be honest forging forging is almost like a drug uh, the more you do it the more you want to do it it's it's just mesmerizing you know it's it's an excellent hobby uh, there's a lot of you know blacksmithing things you can kind of diverge into and there's a lot of different types but I specifically like use this to make knives I make knives I make other metallic objects out of Damascus and I can machine it and you can heat treat it and you'll see here this is the first dip guys I got this on camera now I did an off cut off of one of these billets and you can first see the patterns here and this pattern actually has three different types of colors in it. It's got a manganese bearing steel, which is a darker border. It's got the 1095, which is a lighter gray, and then it has the 15 and 20. You can see three colors here, three different color layers. So I call this tricolor Damascus. It's got a manganese bearing, a 1095, and then a 15 and 20. So you're seeing this for the, this is, I've shot this for the first time. This is the first dip on this. So I didn't even polish this. I just cut this and dipped it. So, but you can see this here and it just came out really nice. And I wasn't too even, you can see how it's kind of it wavy. It's, it's a little, it's not, you know, perfect. The striations aren't perfectly, perfectly horizontal. Um, because when I'm forging, I wasn't quite even in my pressure. Now you'll see this next billet was an off cut of the one I just previously worked as well. I had three billets going. Uh, <clears throat> you'll see this. This is the one that I turned and crushed on the corners after I set it. And you can see the effect that creates in the pattern. Okay. And now you can see that same pattern crushed produces this third type of pattern. Also known as W's or M's or whatever you want to call them. And sometimes you'll cut and restack this and create an even more striking effect. But here's the three different types. This is the three billets that you saw me forging previously. This is all three of them. I just cut and etched these. Now, this is kind of a, a progression, a little bit better of a, a visual on what I just did. So I have alternating layers of 15N20, which is a nickel bearing steel, and then 1085 or 1095. They'll forge well. They'll forge well with 15N20. You stack them together. Get them very clean. You want to make sure you can either use flux, like a borax or something like that, or you can wrap it in sheet metal, seal that off a zero atmosphere, and then it creates an end grain. What you see now is this little end grain, okay? And that was in one of the shots uh, you just previously saw. And I'll actually have those pieces here yeah, as well uh, to compare to. Now, I turned that on its corner and, and, and hit the corners and crushed that while I was foraging. Okay, you'll see that <clears throat> I press those in and then it creates this pattern, which you saw the next pattern there. And it's a very simple progression. And these are subsequently usually cut and restacked to make an explosion pattern or a herringbone pattern or something like that. So this is uh, usually how how people do it. Some people stop right here. You can forge that shape out and make a knife out of it. But uh, if you turn and crush it on its corners, it produces that kind of shape. Now, this is if you take that previous shape and you flatten it. Okay. Now, many times that's cut and restacked after that point. 
and then and then that's that's stacked in another pattern but this can get very complex you can keep going on this guys a lot of people cut and restack and cut and restack but here's a simple uh pattern those are pretty much straight striations other than some of the you know, I didn't have the forge prep. My, my dies weren't perfectly square when I was holding it. So there's a little bit of waviness to it. But that's that pattern right there. And this isn't fully etched all the way. This is just a light etch. But And then I turned it on its side like that. Boom, and crushed it. And now you have that. It produces this kind of pattern. And you can see how the striations, how the pattern kind of warp around the corners when you do that. It creates that effect. That's what that looks like. Now, you flatten that out and crush that out, and then it produces this pattern. Now, this is very, very commonly restacked for an explosion, uh, Damascus. You restack four or five of these like this, and you fuse them together. And I'll probably do a subsequent video on that. And then you can create a uh, uh, another type of pattern, and it gets restacked. So you can easily restack those. Now here's some examples of some Damascus I've made. Now this one is a little different. Now this this was a twist. So I, I got a higher layer count. You look at the striations here. This is more in the 100 to 150 range. But you can see it gets bolder as it goes back. Now what this how I accomplished this is I did a twist. I twisted the Damascus. So after the billet is forged, I clamp it and I get a wrench on the end and I start turning it and turning it. And you can you can start and stop these turns and you can kind of see where the pattern transitions and becomes much bolder. And then as you grind this away, it kind of has a different optical effect. But um, you'll see that here. But this is a higher layer count I did. So I was, this was cut, restacked, then then restacked again to get it's 100 plus. I'm not quite sure exactly it is. But when I did the twist, I stopped and flattened it out, and that's that bold pattern transition. Halfway through the blade, it creates a bold pattern transition here. So that is just one type of pattern. Now, this pattern is unique. I left this pattern bold. This is a low layer count. And after this was etched, I went back and hit it with some sandpaper, and the high spots get really shiny. And then you you see the darker material. This can be further darkened. You can you can you can put it in bluing salts. You can parkerize it. You can uh, you can etch it in coffee. It's all kinds of things you can do to darken that pattern. But so this one also has some twist in it too. And you'll see here it's very easy. That that bar once you're finished forging it out, you clamp the bar in a vise or your forge. You throw a pipe wrench over the end of it. Okay. And you just start twisting. It's that simple. And so that just starts curving that, that metal up. Now you can reforge that. You have to be careful. Some of those ridges can put inclusions into the metal, but it starts making those little angular, these angular striations you see are from the twist, twisting it. So that's about it, guys. This is how I make my Damascus. I hope you like the patterns here. Uh, really, this is a long one. I appreciate you guys hanging in and watching this. Uh, here's some slow-mo shots of a reducing flame. I'm not keeping that oxygen free in there. And I, I really appreciate you guys' time on this. And stay safe out there. And I'll see you guys next time. Thank you very much.